Well, good morning. Everybody survived Thanksgiving? Yeah. yeah? Was catching up with a little bit of your family stories? Yeah? Okay, a couple people said there's a D in the family. No, I don't go there. Okay. Anyway, so, so good to see you. And um, you know, just to be together after Thanksgiving, um, that's kind of a season that earmarks us into the Christmas season, or I guess we should say the Advent season. Advent is a Latin word for adventus, and, and that means the coming or the anticipation. And so we gather as Christians. This actually is the beginning of the Christian uh, calendar. It's not the end. It's actually the beginning because everything begins with Advent. And it ends um, where we just came after Pentecost in ordinary time. But uh, what a great time to be together. You know, we're starting to see some lights. Anybody have lights in their neighborhood yet? Yeah, anybody put up a tree yet? Ours is kind of half up. It's outside in water, no lights yet. But, but at least we, we took that step. And I have a feeling I have a job later today. <laughs> and it's not napping either. But anyway, <laughs> but, um, so great. Uh, we're here in Advent. And uh, we're, we're starting a series called Simply Christmas. And we really, um, we really prayed hard about what this uh, series would be called. And it's just kind of like uh, the world in, in life has just been complicated. So, so that word simply, simple, simplicity, simply. And we wanted to kind of just kind of go back to a childlike state of, man, it's just simply Christmas. And so our hope is over the next uh, several weeks together, coming into uh, Christmas Eve and then the Sunday after Christmas, that we really want to engage in some topics that remind us of this beautiful yet simple message of what Christmas is. Um, as we uh, start off today, I just want to share with you a story. I think it's kind of in line with the season. Uh, a young man wanted to play football. Now, my son-in-law, he, he played football in college. I played in high school. I wasn't as good as him. I was only high school. He was college. And uh, but so I was thinking about, you know, uh, he was a defensive and offensive person. I was an offensive lineman. And you kind of had to really think through stuff. So you kind of had to know what you were doing because you had to memorize plays. Well, this young man wanted to play football. He went to his coach and his coach was like, I just don't think that you have what it takes to remember all these plays. That was a nice way of saying, I don't think you have what it takes to play football. And so the young man pleaded and pleaded and pleaded, and the coach finally just said, look, I'm going to give you a, a test. There's three questions. You can, you can take these questions home, come back and see me in a couple of days. If you pass the test, then we'll talk about whether you get a shot on the football team. So the three questions were, how many seconds are there in a year? Um, what days of the week begin with T? And how many Ds are in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? Okay, so everybody's calculating, you know, calculators are out. So the kid goes away, he comes back a couple days later, he says, coach, I've got the answers. He says, you know, that first question was, how many seconds are there in a year? He says, there's 12. And the coach goes, 12, how'd you get that? You know, there's, he says, well, there's January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd. Go, okay, well, I hadn't thought about that, but hey, that's pretty good. He said, now the second question, what, what do you think about that? What, what days of the week begin with T? And the kid looks at the coach, he says, coach, that's easy, it's today and tomorrow. It's like, wow, you know, again, this is, you know, this isn't orthodox, but I kind of like the way you think. He said, now, here's the clincher. How many Ds are in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? And the kid says, coach, that one's easy. It took me a while, but I got it. There's 138 Ds in Red Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. He said, how'd you come up with that? He says, dee, 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 <laughs> Seriously? Come on now. Hey, listen, nine, at nine o'clock, loved it. Show me, show me some love. Show me some love, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I told them, I said, don't worry. You won't have to survive stories like that much longer. Anyway, okay. So I, oh, don't say that. Okay. Listen, um, outside of these stories that I get to tell you on Sunday, um, yeah, everything's in a message, right? So everything's a message. Messaging is part of life. Uh, how we talk to each other, there's a message. If you write notes, there's a message. If you send an email, there's a message. A text, there's a message. Everything's messaging and messaging. So, so the question becomes, you know, what kind of message do you want to hear this Christmas? I think it's a great season to ask that question. What kind of message do you want to hear for Christmas? If you're a kid, you're probably wanting to hear the message that that gift that they're saying won't be delivered on Christmas Day, that when you wake up, the message you want to hear is this going to be under the tree, Right? Some people, this Christmas season, uh, the message they want to hear is the word forgiveness. Forgiveness plays a huge part in Christmas. And, and if you think about that, what a great gift to give somebody in Christmas. What a great gift to receive from somebody at Christmas. So maybe forgiveness is that as well. Uh, some, some people, um, you know, you're caught up in this uh, real estate crunch right now. You know, I read just two days ago that if you're renting a single-family home, 30 to 40 to 50% increase in rent the coming year. 
So maybe the message you want to hear if you're renting like that is you want to hear your landlord say, I'm not going to raise your rent. So, so it's all in messaging. It's all of that. And my guess is that, you know, we, we've all kind of been on this roller coaster this, this past year. We thought 2020 was bad. 2021 wasn't a whole lot better. It was a little bit better. We thought we were through the pandemic, then it kind of came back with a vengeance. Politics seems to still be the, the, the catalyst of things that kind of uh, uh, rivals us up. Some of us in the room, you know, we're, we're nurturing losses from our great college football teams and things like that. So the year wasn't really what we had thought. Uh, what that would be. And, and, and I was thinking, you know, I always ask for pistachios in my stocking. Who else has a special stocking gift? Anybody else? Ed does. Carol says, Ed does. Ed, what is it? Or are you allowed to say? Fruitcake. Fruitcake. Okay. Ed gets doorstops on Christmas. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> So I, I, like, uh, I like pistachios, but this year, because of the way the year has been, I think I'm just going to ask for some Pepto-Bismol. I mean, think about it. it, it it's been a challenge, it, and things have been so, so difficult. Well, the Christmas season, you're doing one of two things. You're either experiencing the light and living in the light, or you're experiencing and living in the darkness. Darkness and light are two themes all throughout the scriptures. We find it from the Genesis story all the way to Revelation, from the first to the last. We find everything in between. It's this constant, epic battle between darkness and light. Light represents God and the, and the values of Christ. Darkness represents evil. So, so we have a choice. So some of us today, we're either living in light or we're living in darkness. And, and so the struggles begin with those kind of things. Now, historically, God's people have always had bouts of darkness. God's people have always lived in bouts of darkness. No matter where, where you are, what century you're in, or where you live or whatever, if you are a person of God, then the odds are that you have probably um, experienced some sense of darkness. So in this series, Simply Christmas, we want to begin with the writings of Isaiah, the great prophet. Isaiah is one who gives birth to a story simply told, a story about the Christ child coming in as the savior of the world. And, and so it's appropriate for us to begin there. And, and during Isaiah's time, we see a lot of darkness. We see the people of God living in darkness. They're struggling in darkness. So it's, it's really appropriate for us to begin with Isaiah. So what was going on in that time? Well, the Assyrian king, uh, tiglath Pileser III, he invaded Israel. And so now all of a sudden we have northern Israel and we have southern Israel. So we have Israel and Judah constantly at battle. The, the Davidic kingdom has been divided. They have good kings and they have bad kings. They have good kings and evil kings. And they're not getting along. So Israel is divided. Darkness has come in. And we begin to start to see that, that these alliances are being formed between Assyria and Damascus and, and Israel and Judah. And everything just goes to kibosh. And all of a sudden, you know, the northern kingdom, they allied with Damascus. That alliance lasted a few years. And then all of a sudden, Assyria came in and just destroyed everything and took, took all of God's people off into captivity. And so darkness prevailed, and it was there. And we saw for years and years and years, the people of God prayed for the light. They prayed for something to happen, something that would come and bring the goodness of God back into the life and to the hearts of people. And so when you think about that, what's the kind of message that a nation that has been plundered by another nation needs to hear? What's the, what's the uh, thing that, that a country who has had loss after loss after loss and, and overtaken and its people being shot into other countries, what's the message that they need to hear? Henceforth, this is the story of Isaiah. So Isaiah comes right out and he says something very important. He says, folks, remember this, that the darkness cannot overcome the light, or more importantly, the light always overcomes the darkness. Light will always overcome darkness. Now, notice he doesn't say that there will never be darkness. He says light always overcomes darkness. So let's, let's go to chapter 9, and let's look at what he says. I want to work a little bit in chapter 9 today. He says, nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. So Isaiah is saying right on the front, be encouraged, have hope. That whatever darkness that you are living in, whatever darkness is upon you, it's not going to last forever. He says that the land of Zebulon and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. He's calling out a region. 
Galilee. Galilee, if you look at it on a map, has several towns that we're familiar with as we read the scriptures. It has several places as we know the stories of Jesus. And, and Isaiah is saying, you know, years, hundreds and hundreds of years before this, before this actually happens, he's saying this is the region that something great is going to happen. He says the people who walk in darkness, they're going to see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. The people were devastated. They were in captivity. And Isaiah is proclaiming a word. It's kind of like coming out of nowhere, like, what do you mean we're going to be okay? Are you sure about that? And he's proclaiming this message that darkness cannot prevail. Now, I find it, um, I find it interesting that, that when Isaiah talks about Galilee, the land past the Jordan, I, I started thinking about Jesus' ministry, and if you go back and you look at kind of like where Jesus, where he was born and where he started ministry and the major things that he happened, it all comes together. It is the land past the Jordan, the land of Galilee. And, and we see things here. So Jesus left Galilee after he was to be baptized by John in the Jordan. Then he went back and he began his ministry there. So we see a significant piece there. Jesus called his disciples in Galilee. Remember the stories that we see in the Gospels with the fishermen? Come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men and women. He said also to Matthew, who was the tax collector, you know, basically turn away from a life of, of, um, of, of you know, obstructing people and, and follow me, and I will change who you are. So all of the disciples are called in Galilee. Jesus' first miracle, John tells us the miracle. Who knows what the first miracle was? He turned water into wine. Where did he do it? He did it at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. So Cana was a, a kind of like a suburb, a portion of Galilee. So Jesus' first miracles happened there. He may have been born in Bethlehem, which is in Judea, but he was known as the Messiah during the time of his life because of his ministry in Galilee. So Isaiah, hundreds of years before, is, is proclaiming that this light is coming, and he's pinpointing exactly where all this is going to happen. And this is no wonder why Matthew could say this in his gospel as Matthew is recalling uh, the remnant of this, of this promise. Matthew says, when, when Jesus heard that his cousin John the Baptist had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to where? Galilee. He went first to Nazareth and left there and moved to Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. Is this sounding familiar? And this fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah, that a light will come. Something special is going to happen, that the darkness upon which the people currently live, the darkness will go away for the light will come. I find it amazing when you think about light and dark and, and the struggles all throughout our history. Think about it for a second. Let's go back to the Dark Ages. Why was it called the Dark Ages? Well, because Duke Power didn't exist back then, okay? And so, so it was the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, and, and it was just a, a dark, very dystopic kind of um, place to live. And, and Patty and I, we, we love to watch these ancient movies of history. Not that they're old movies, but movies of ancient history, I should say. And the days of like knights and the queens and kings in Europe and how dark it was back then. And so we know that this is a fact, but, but during that middle age and during that portion there, this is when the Reformation was birthed. The Reformation brought light. It brought the gospel of Jesus to proclaim all throughout Europe and the world. We see in our own country the great revivals of the Great Awakening, when our country was in a, a sense of deep darkness in, in the 1700s, and, 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 and the Great Awakening comes, and, and the spiritual values of preachers like George Whitfield and, and John Wesley and others awaken, and Jonathan Edwards awaken our spirits for the Holy Spirit to do its great work. And even in Jesus' time, Rome cast a pall of darkness upon God's people and oppressed them and Jesus was the light that came to lead people to salvation. And I'm guessing this morning, if you think about your own darkness, if you think about a time where darkness prevailed in your life, maybe it's now, maybe it was not long ago, but, but darkness, you experience that. I bet you can also not just experience the darkness or think about that, but you can recall how the light came into your life and how the light changed you and transformed you for all that's good. So Isaiah's message talks about, you know, Jesus is coming. He also says something very important, that God's joy is eternal. 
So eternal, it doesn't end. That joy isn't something that we say, I think I'll be joyful today. That's happiness. I can choose to be happy or I can choose to be unhappy. But joy comes from God. It's seated inside of us. It can't be taken away. The question is, will, will we recognize the joy that's there? And so God's joy is eternal. So, so what we find out is that, that God is declaring an eternal joy in this story of Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah goes on and he writes, he says that you will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing plunder. So that's two great examples. A harvest, you know, people are always hungry during this time. A harvest means plenty, joyful that. And he also gives us the flip side of the great battles that occurred. And when you lost a battle, your things were uh, confiscated by the ones who won the battle, the plunders. And he, so he, he gives us an idea of both levels of joy. For you will break the yoke of the slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will be burned and they will become fuel for the fire. I love this. I mean, think about it. What, what's the one thing that most people fear? We fear war. We don't want to be at war. But what Isaiah is saying is that this eternal joy that's coming, imagine that, that nations won't even need armies. We won't need any branches of service. We can say to those that serve, thank you, but we don't need an army or navy anymore. We don't need any weapons because nobody in the world is trying to confiscate somebody else that the whole world lives at peace. And Isaiah is saying that this kind of joy can come, and he's reminding us of the significance of that. I mean, think about that. You know, what would it be like to live in a world where we didn't have to worry about war, where we didn't have to worry about oppressors, where we didn't have to worry about aggression? And Jesus' coming is one that highlights that that will dissipate. So Isaiah, a little bit earlier, said this. He said, the, the Lord will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. So, so they're, they're, they're reclaiming and they're repurposing the weapons of war. And instead of killing being weapons that kill, they're beating them down into weapons of productivity, of humanity, to feed people. He said, nation will no longer fight against nation nor train for war anymore. See, this is, this is the kind of hope of a people who's, who's living in a time of conflict a people who are living in a time of uncertainty, a people who are living in other nations because the nation that they love has been plundered and overtaken by the enemy. And Isaiah is saying the day will come that the soldiers' boots and their uniforms, they'll light the fires to keep you warm because they won't need those anymore. The light is coming. So how can this be? So, so think about it. I mean, we think today about what would it be like to have a world like that? And, and some people will say, that's just too far-fetched. You know, we're dreaming. We'll never not have armies and navies and all that. We'll never not have weapons of war. But you see, in the kingdom of God, God is calling for that kind of kingdom. Because if it's a God kingdom, then there's no need to have more. There's no need to oppress somebody else. There's no need to overtake the values or, or become a captive of something else. You know, he tells us here that God brings joy through the Son, Jesus Christ. So how's this gonna happen? He's gonna tell us it's gonna happen through Jesus. How do we find peace? Jesus. How do we find a system where we can live in harmony? Jesus. How can we find salvation? Jesus. And he says it this way. He says, for us, uh, for a child has been born for us, the gift of a son for us, He'll, he'll take over the running of the world uh, and his names will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. His ruling authority will grow and there'll be no limits to the wholeness that he brings. He'll rule from the historic throne of David over that promised kingdom and he'll put that kingdom on a firm footing and keep it going with fair dealing and right living beginning now and lasting always. The zeal of the God of the arch of the angel armies will do all of this. So Isaiah is saying that, that this message, we have to look at, at, at what's gonna happen, a couple things. A, a child is gonna be born. So the prophecy says, look for a child. 
The second thing he tells us is that, that, that the Messiah will be the Son. The Messiah will be called Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, um, Mighty Warrior, all of those names. And the good news is that Isaiah's message says is that God will make this personal. That this isn't something just to read about. This isn't something just to be told about. But that God will make this experience personal in history and with those who aren't there at that particular time. It's eternal, and that eternal history will happen. You see, here, here's the point. In, in the end, there's going to be two groups of people in the world. There are those who are going to need this child, and there are going to be those who don't, okay? Okay. Um, if, if you're doing just fine right now, if you're on your own, if, you, if you're winning victory after victory and you're not having any troubles at all, if, if, you, don't, uh, if you don't need to see any darkness, if your, light, if your life is so filled with brightness that you have to wear shades, then maybe the gospel message isn't for you yet. Yet. But if you're like me, it's totally different from that. If you feel the darkness, if you feel weary at times, if you need rest, if you mourn and you long for comfort, if you feel worthless at times and you wonder if God even cares, if you fail and desire strength, if you sin and you need a savior, then this light described by Isaiah, this light is for you. This light is for me. It's for all of us. You see, we don't deserve the light, but we receive the light. We can't buy the light. We can't uh, do works to get the light. The light is a gift. It's given by God. And the way that we do that is, is we abide by what Jesus said when he went to the land past the Jordan in Galilee. And he said, repent of your sin and live a life worthy of God. So it calls that attention for us. It's an invitation for those of us who have experienced broken dreams or unkept promises or shattered hopes. For those of us who have uh, disordered desires or, or a pile of sins that we can't believe that we've committed. The entry into this glorious kingdom, into this marvelous light, is simply this. Just need Jesus. If you need Jesus, then that light is for you. That light will come. And I have to bet that, that in 2021, most of us, if not all of us, really need the light and recognize that we're not perfect and that we can be a mess. But Jesus says, then be my mess. I'll take care of you. I will love you. I'll grow you. I'll save you. I'll redeem you. I'll give you the light so that you can live. But wait, there's more. By coming to us in Christ, God's put his salvation so low that anyone can reach it. It's so low, anybody can reach it. But you gotta do two things. You gotta surrender your pride. You can't be prideful. You have to become humble, you can't be prideful. And secondly, you have to submit yourself to the salvation of a baby. And that's what the Christmas season reminds us of, is that God came into the world to be with us. You see, this is, this is kind of where a lot of us are. We, we, we need this Christmas miracle. We need this light. We need, we need this story to be simply told. Because the truth is that we all are at a place where, where maybe we found that we've been unfaithful or, or maybe we're, we're at a point where maybe you're at a point where you think that God can't accept you back yet because your life has just been so discombobulated. Maybe you're, you feel that repentance can't last, that God can't forgive you or, or that your sins seem to be unending and they just kind of hang out there. Maybe some of you this morning, maybe you just need rest. And you need God to just be that light that warms your heart and gives you the rest that you need. You know what? If you're like me and you're any one of those things, don't stay away. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and experience. God's not asking you to deserve him. God is basically saying, receive him. Receive him. He's your gift. He's the light to take you out of darkness. Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a savior is given. He is Christ the Lord, and he will remove the darkness and the oppression from our life. What a powerful name in the name of Jesus, who is the light of the world, who came in the darkness to bring us new life. 
Let's pray. Lord God, as we ponder these words, help us to live into the truth that out of the darkness comes the light and that you call us to be children of light. May we stand in the presence of Jesus of Galilee and may that Christ child bring us the hope now and forever in Jesus' name, amen.